Hi, my name is Joanne Kim, and today I'm here to teach you some fundamental photography skills. I am a photographer and educator, and I initially came to photography through the lens of contemporary art. Um, but currently my practice is in documentary and photojournalism. Um, something I really love about documentary and photojournalism is that you never really know what's going to happen and who you might encounter and meet in a day's work. So I really love connecting with people and with different places and um, exploring them through my lens. Currently, I teach at Cal State Long Beach and at Otis College of Art and Design. Um, so you can see I'm really passionate and excited about teaching photography. Um, today, I'm excited to be here with you to teach you some fundamental skills that will help you develop uh, your creative vision and voice. So you might think that the most important thing you're, you'll be learning in this course is how to use your camera. And don't worry, we're definitely going to get into that. Um, but I would say that the most important thing that you can learn as a photographer is how to see. We probably look at hundreds of images a day, but which ones actually help us see something in a new way? Which images help us to tell a meaningful or inspiring story? Which ones allow us to see re a new reality or capture an emotion or move us with their beauty? So we're going to start by looking at some images. This photograph is by Steve McCurry, who photographed for years in India. He works with light, contrast, color, framing, shape, and form with such artistry that one is struck by the beauty of an average morning. This image is by a photographer named Robert Frank, who was a Swiss photographer who traveled the U.S. for two years and published a historical book called The Americans. Um, in this image, we see through his framing and timing that he was able to capture a poignant moment on each of the trolley riders' faces which feels like they tell so much about this moment of time in America. Um, in this image by Sally Gall, she transforms the everyday image of clothes flying on the laundry line, which helps us to notice what we might see every day in a new way. The mundane becomes transformed into an abstract array of patterns and colors that evokes a sense of freedom and movement. So before we begin the camera tutorial, I suggest following along with this video with your camera in hand and be sure that your cap battery is charged. So let's cover the basics of the equipment associated with your DSLR, which stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex Camera. So this is the camera body. This is the lens. I have a CF card, compact flash or SD card that goes inside of your camera. There's also a camera strap, which I currently don't have on. Um, I also have a lens cap that's here. I've got a lens filter that's on the lens of my camera, which we'll talk about more later. And you just want to avoid getting any dirt or dust or water inside of your camera body. Um, so sand and dirt can get into the crevices of your camera and eventually damage it and damage the parts. So you want to be mindful if you're shooting in very windy conditions or in a sandy or dusty area. Always use a rain shield to protect your camera when shooting out in the rain. Um, what happens with the rain shield is that it covers the entirety of your camera body, but it allows for your lens to be open to take the shot. A good practice is to keep the lens cap on your lens when you're not shooting and to keep the back cap on your lens when it's disattached. But the same goes for the camera body. So there's a body cap that comes with your camera and you always wanna leave the cap on the camera body when it's disattached from your lens. Um, so there are really sensitive components that are inside of your camera and your camera sensor. So you always want to be, sh be sure to protect that from anything that, that can enter in that might damage the components. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a lens filter. Um, a lot of people don't end up purchasing one, but if you spend a lot of money on your lens, you want to be sure to purchase a filter, um, which can range in price from $10 to $75, depending on what you choose. But it is a really inexpensive option for protecting your lens from any kind of damage, and it's much better than having to replace a lens that could cost up to $2,000. With a DSLR camera or a digital single lens reflex, there's actually a mirror that's here um, that also uh, flips when you hit the camera and it also works to protect your sensor along with the shutter that's closed. So your camera sensor does need to get cleaned periodically. You'll know when you see spots on your photo that appear um, and they generally appear most clearly in areas with large swaths of a singular like darker toned color. Um, for example, like a cloudless dark blue sky just after sunset. Um, so you might see some spots that look like watermarks and a lot of times 
those are uh, as a result of uh, your sensor being a little bit dirty. But they can also come from water spots that sit on, on your lens filter or on your lens. So just be sure to wipe your lens and then try to take another test shot and see if that image turns out. And if you still have spots, that means that your camera sensor is dirty. Okay, so now I just wanna discuss a bit about how to safely clean your camera. Um, I have here in front of me a blower, a lens cloth, and um, a soft bristled brush. A lot of times these are little kits that come when you purchase your camera, sometimes they'll throw it in. Um, oh, I also have some liquid lens cleaner. Um, so you wanna be mindful again of not scratching your lens. Um, so a lens wipe is always something that I think is a, ne a necessity to have in your pocket as a photographer. Um, it's really easy to get some smudges on your lens, so when that happens, you just take your wipe and you just wipe it off. Um, I also use it sometimes to wipe off uh, the back of my camera, the, uh, the viewfinder, or the LCD screen, which can get smudges as well. But if you are out in a dirty or dusty kind of situation where they, there may be um, some specks of sand or, you know, kind of uh, little uh, pieces of dirt or kind of small pebbles or something like that that could possibly get on the front of your camera lens. Rather than wiping it with a lens cloth, which might end up scratching your lens because it'll rub up against it, what you want to do in that situation is either use your blower to blow off the debris, or you can also very gently use um, your, your brush to brush it off very delicately. But I first suggest always using the blower, and then you can use the brush, and then you can then use your lens, lens wipe. So with liquid lens cleaning solution, um, you want to be very careful with this. You never want to squirt the liquid directly onto your lens. You never want to squirt any liquid on any part of your camera body at all. So if you do need to use uh, the lens cleaner, then I really suggest that you first uh, dabble it onto your lens cleaning cloth and then use your lens cleaning cloth uh, to then clean the lens appropriately. So let's get into exploring our cameras. I have in my hand a Canon 5D Mark IV DSLR. I'm going to cover and include Canon and Nikon systems, but you might have a different camera system. Um, but the basic parts of the camera are the same for uh, all DSLR and mirrorless camera bodies. Um, though the location of the menus and the buttons might be a little bit different. Um, but you can always download a manual for your camera if you don't have one on hand. Um, that'll help you identify the different parts and settings that we'll be discussing throughout the video. Um, I'm going to start with identifying parts of the camera. So this is the lens. Um, on the lens, you have a switch that is uh, AF-MF, and that stands for autofocus or manual focus. You've also got a focus ring. Um, for those of you who have zoom lenses, you'll also have a second ring that's a zoom ring. My lens is a prime, so it doesn't have that. Um, you also have the shutter release button at the top here, the viewfinder, which is where you'll look through. Um, next to the viewfinder is something called a lens diopter, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, there is the, the shutter uh, mode dial up at the very top. Um, and you have different dials throughout uh, your screen. So we have got the LCD monitor that's here where you can view your images. Um, I have a dial on the back and I also have a dial at the top, which allows me to change my f-stop and shutter speed settings um, along with walk through the menu. For some of you, you may not have a dial on the back. You may have a button that you push, um, and when you push it in, you can change the dial at the top to different settings. Okay, there's also a play button, uh, a magnifier button to magnify your images after you shoot them. Um, most of our cameras also have the capacity to shoot video and still, so I actually have a dial that notes that here at the top as well. Um, so on the side of the camera, You've also got different areas where you can, uh, where there are different inputs available. So there are symbols on, for each one. So I've got headphone, mic, flash, HDMI, and USB. So if you open those compartments, you'll see that you can plug in the appropriate cable into that area. So um, as I talked about earlier, you always wanna be sure to not let any dust get into your camera. So you wanna keep these doors closed. Um, uh, when you're not using them because there is dirt and dust that can go in through the openings. Okay, so also next to your lens is um, 
a release button for for the lens if you want to take your lens off and re, uh, and uh, replace it with a different lens type. Something that's really important to note is that you always want to keep your camera off before you take out the any of the cards or your battery. Um, if you don't do so, you risk damaging the files that are on uh, your cards. So you always want to be sure to make it to have a turn off. So on the side here, side compartment, my camera takes a compact flash card, a CF card, these larger size cards, as well as an SD card. For most of you, um, your camera will simply take an SD card. And there's also a compartment on the bottom for the battery. So I can just take the battery out and take it in. So you always want to keep that door shut as well um, when you're, you know, your battery is out or you're charging your battery. So now we're going to go into your camera's menu settings. Um, every camera's make and model will have different menu options, but we're only going to go over a couple of the menu settings today. All cameras which allow you to shoot manually should also have a setting where you can change the image quality to RAW. So what is a RAW file? A RAW file is one that contains no loss of data and it's not compressed at all. So it contains the most information that your digital sensor can capture, and some people even call it a digital negative. Um, RAW files are much, much larger than JPEG files, um, and they're generally between 18 megabytes to 30 megabytes, depending on your camera. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure that the image quality is set to RAW on my camera. Um, so make sure that it's set to RAW only rather than RAW plus L, as that's going to save a RAW file and a JPEG file on your, um, on your card, and it's just going to take up more file space. Um, so let me go ahead and do that now. So I'm going to turn on my camera, go to the menu. Menu number one under camera, there's image quality and it's RAW. So I'm going to go ahead and select that, and I have different options here. I have RAW and JPEG. So I want to make sure that it's selected to RAW, and then under JPEG, it's selected to minus, which means that it will not include a JPEG file with the RAW file as a save. And once I scroll over and have that set, then I just hit OK, and it's set there, and now it should show up and say that your image quality is RAW. So to edit and work with RAW files, you'll need to use photo editing software such as Adobe Lightroom or Photoshop or any type of RAW processing software. There seem to be quite a few programs that you can use as well if you don't want to pay for an Adobe subscription that I hear work really well. Um, but if you simply want to shoot JPEGs um, to save file space or because it's easier for you to handle the files, then by all means keep your image set to JPEG. I just want to mention though that you want to be sure to shoot at the highest quality JPEG that you possibly can to be able to capture the highest resolution that's possible on your camera. So something else that may seem kind of unimportant to people, but I think it actually is extremely helpful, is to make sure that you have the right date and time set on your camera. And this is going to help you uh, learn more about light and exposure, because it, then you can see what time of day you actually photographed an image. And if you ever need to reshoot, you can go back to the location and you know what the light is like at that time of day. So let's go ahead and go to our camera menu and navigate over to where we can change the date and time. And it'll be located in different places in different people's cameras. So I've rolled over and it looks like actually my date uh, and time is that my time is set to be seven minutes past uh, the correct time. So I'm gonna go ahead and change that right now. I'm gonna move the dial so I can roll the dial over and then um, use my button to actually you know, increase or decrease the date and time. And when I have it set correctly, I just hit set, OK, and then I have the correct date and time set on my camera. So now we'll, we're going to talk about the shooting mode style. Um, this is a dial that's at the top left of your camera where you can set the different shooting modes. Um, I'm going to quickly note the semi-automatic shooting modes, although today we're going to be focusing on shooting in manual mode. Um, in order to have more control of the settings on your camera, your shooting modes usually need to be set to TV on Canon or S on Nikon. AV on Canon or A on Nikon or M which stands for manual. So TV or S stands for shutter priority mode, AV or A stands for aperture priority mode, and M stands for manual mode. We'll get into what shutter priority and aperture priority are a bit later, but we're mostly going to focus on using manual mode on your cameras, so please set your dial to it. Okay, so now let's talk about the diopter. 
The diopter is a small dial that sits to the right of your viewfinder. Um, you'll notice a minus and a plus symbol next to the dial, and the diopter adjustment actually allows you to customize the focus in the viewfinder to your right eye without wearing your glasses or contacts. So if you're shooting with your glasses on or your contacts in or have perfect vision, keep the diopter set to neutral. So on Canon cameras, you can set it to neutral by matching the part of the, di the dial that's a little bit larger in thickness to the midline between the minus and plus symbols. I bring up the diopter because sometimes the dial gets moved unintentionally in your camera bag or you may unknowingly adjust it. And so one way to know whether it has been moved is to see if the text and numbers in green at the bottom of your viewfinder are in focus. If they're out of focus, you need to adjust the diopter until the text is in focus to your eye. So this is an issue when you're focusing manually and then you take your photos back and you look at them on your computer and you notice that everything's out of focus. But you could swear that you shot them in focus when you were taking the shot. So the reason I found a lot of times the reason why that happens is because people have accidentally moved the diopter on the side of their viewfinder. So this might sound a little bit silly, but now I'm going to talk, talk about how to hold the camera properly. Um, that'll help you take the best and most steady shots. Okay, so you can see that the camera is really built in an ergonomic way, especially DSLRs. So there's a grip on the side for your right hand, and then you use your, so you can hold it, and then on the back of the camera, there's also a place to comfortably place your thumb. So you wanna use your index finger to hit the shutter release button on the camera. But what I find a lot of times is that people don't really know what to do with their left hand. So it's really important to use your left hand to brace the bottom of your camera to keep it as steady as possible. So what I do is I, I use the palm of my hand and I brace it on the bottom of the camera, so it's sitting in the palm of my hand, and then you can use your index finger and your thumb to then move the focus ring on your lens or move the zoom um, dial on your lens if you have that uh, capacity on your zoom lens. Um, but you can see now, and sometimes I guess you, I, I also use my um, middle finger and my ring finger to kind of hold the other side. So you can see how steady the camera is in my hand when I hold it in this position. So if I'm, just, if I'm doing this, which a lot of people do, is they just have their arm free floating and their hand is just being moved to use a dial, but you can see that it's a bit dif more difficult to hold the camera steady if that's the way you're operating. So essentially you're kind of trying to hold your body like a tripod. You're trying to hold it as steady as possible. So, so Sometimes people shoot this way too with their arms extended and their elbows out, and that also creates um, some instability. So what you wanna do is you wanna keep your shoulders down, keep your elbows to your side. It doesn't have, you know, just stay relaxed while you do it. And then you can see that it's easy to just remain steady before you take the shot. So I'm gonna just turn to the side and you can see how my hand is on the left. So now you're ready to practice focusing and taking a shot. If you're shooting with an autofocus lens, there's a switch on your lens to toggle between manual focus, MF, or autofocus, AF. So let's go ahead and start with manual focus. So when is a good time to manually focus? If you're shooting a landscape or a scene or a still life that does not move, then manual focusing would work well since your subject is staying perfectly still. So sometimes in dimmer lighting or if the, folk, if the subject is a similar tone as the background, your camera also might have a hard time with autofocusing. So it's sometimes better to be able to uh, focus manually on those scenes. So to manually focus, you simply turn the focus dial on your lens until it looks in focus in the viewfinder. So um, most of us will likely be using autofocus because it's a bit faster to use. Um, but so with autofocus, there are two different types of autofocus modes. There's continuous and single. So a camera's default autofocus setting is single autofocus set to automatic point selection. So what this means is that when you depress your shutter release button halfway, your camera is set to automatically find the subject in your frame and focus on it. So some of you might have noticed in your viewfinder that like when you're focusing on your subject, your camera's, the viewfinder, there are a bunch of dots that seem to go kind of wild. <laughs> and you're trying to focus on something, you're trying to focus in on something that's maybe in the center, but your camera's autofocus wants to focus on something that's on the edges of the frame. So it can be really maddening because you can't get the shot that you want. So I'm gonna show you how to set your autofocus settings to best work with the subjects that you'll be shooting. 
So if you're photographing a moving subject, you should set your camera to continuous autofocus, which is called AI Servo on a Canon or AF-C on Nikon. So on my Canon, I push the button on the top right that says, um, a that says Drive AF. So I can use my dial to change the autofocus setting to AI Servo. And now you're gonna point your camera towards your subject and to press the shutter button halfway down for the camera to focus on your subject. Keep it held that way. Your camera will continue to adjust the focus if the subject moves or even if you move. And then when you're ready to take the shot, all you have to do is push the shutter button down all the way. But you have to remember that you have to keep the shutter release button depressed halfway the entire time until you take the shot for the moving subject to be in focus. So if you mostly shoot moving subjects such as sports, dancers, or active young kids or animals, having your camera set to continuous autofocus would probably work best for you. So personally, I have my camera set to single autofocus mode with spot focus set to center. Um, for me, this allows the most control and single autofocus mode is one shot AF on a Canon or AF-S on a Nikon. So to work in this mode, you set your subject to the center of the frame, depress the shutter release button halfway down, and keep it held halfway down while you reframe your shot. When you've got your shot composed the way you want it to be, then you can push the shutter release button down all the way to take the shot. So what I like about this is that it guarantees that the focus is where I want it to be as long as the subject hasn't moved around that much. But it does take a little bit of practice, though it's much more accurate than using the default automatic point selection setting on your camera, which typically focuses on the point that falls over the object closest to the lens. You can also move the spot focus point to another point in the frame fairly quickly by hitting the AF point selection button. When you look through your viewfinder, you can use your dials to move the point selection to the areas of your frame that you want to be in focus. So, um, so now I'm going to show you how to use fully manual settings on your digital camera for ultimate creative control. There are basically three elements that you need to set on your camera that control the exposure, the ISO, the depth of field or f-stop, and the shutter speed. So we're first going to begin with a discussion of the ISO. Your camera's ISO setting determines how sensitive your sensor will be to capturing the light in a scene. So the range is generally between 100 to at least 6400. For my camera, the ISO can go up to 25,600. So you want to make sure to set your ISO to the lowest possible setting so that you can capture the highest image quality possible. If you shoot at the higher ISO settings, your image can become noisy. So let's take a look at some images and compare what they look like at different ISO settings. Look at the noisy image on the right shot at ISO 6400 compared to the same image shot at ISO 100 on the left. You can see the difference in how crisp and clear the image is with the image on the left. For many newer camera models, huge improvements have been made in capturing clearer images at higher ISO numbers, so it does depend on the make and model of your camera. So here's a chart showing you what to set your ISO to for specific lighting situations. It's suggested that on a bright and sunny day, you should set your ISO to 100 or lower. On cloudy days, set it to ISO 400. When indoors under dimmer lighting or when the sun has gone down, set it to ISO 800 or 1600. Um, if, there, if the quality of your camera allows it, you can actually set the ISO to 3200 or above in dark conditions at night. Most have, cameras have a button either on the top of the camera body or on the back of the body that allows you to directly click on it to set the ISO. You can also go into the menu of the camera to change the ISO. And you can always look in your camera's manual to help you if you have trouble locating where to change the ISO. So one of the creative controls you have on your camera that's also one of the three elements of exposure is the shutter speed. The shutter speed determines the amount of time your camera shutter is open to let light in to expose your shot. It also determines how movement is captured in your image. Shutter speed is represented on your camera as a numeric value 60, 80, 100, 125, etc but this actually represents a fraction of a second. 1 60th of a second, 1 80th of a second, 1 100th of a second, 1 1 25th of a second, etc. I'm going to take off the lens of my camera to demonstrate how the shutter works. So I can change the shutter speed by moving the dial uh, on the top right of my camera. The number on the far left of my display shows my shutter speed. 
Let's start with 1 60th of a second, which is for most people the slowest shutter speed that your camera can be set to, to be handheld without getting camera shake and creating a blurred image. On this DSLR, there's a mirror in front of the shutter that pops up when the shutter is released. You can see that 1 60th of a second is fairly quick. If you want to freeze the motion of a fast moving subject, you could set your shutter speed to a faster setting, perhaps 1 500th of a second or faster. So you can see how much more quickly that shutter was released rather than the 1 60th of a second exposure. So let's look at this image of a fast moving subject shot at 1 500th of a second. You can see that though the cars are moving at around 30 miles an hour, they're frozen in motion and pretty crisp and clear. If you want to create a motion blur with a moving subject, you need to work with a slower shutter speed, generally, generally something slower than 1 30th of a second. I'll set it to 1 8th of a second and you can see how slowly the shutter opens and closes. Now let's look at an image shot at 1 8th of a second. You can see how the car is blurred. And let's look at an even longer shutter speed of 4 seconds. In this image, the headlights of the cars create a long line through the frame. With my Canon 5D Mark IV, the fastest shutter speed I can set my camera to is 1 8,000th of a second. And the longest shutter speed is 30 seconds. I also have a bulb mode on my shooting dial that's noted as B. This allows me to shoot for as long as I'd like. The fastest shutter speed on your camera might be different. Um, let's take a look at this chart of a running person and how the different shutter speeds might capture them. The shutter speed also controls how much light is captured onto your sensor. The longer the shutter is open, the more light is let in, and the shorter amount of time the shutter is open, the less light is captured. So in this image, taken at night, although it is quite dark at night, the shutter speed is set to two seconds. Exposing the scene for a long exposure like two seconds allows the sensor to capture the available light for a longer period of time. So although it's shot at night, a scene can still be exposed. Something important to remember about shutter speed is that when you shoot at a shutter speed that's slower than 1 60th of a second, you should put your camera on a tripod as your image will experience some motion blur from the slightest shake of your hands and turn out blurry. And you should use a remote trigger or set your camera to self-timer to prevent any camera shake from pressing the shutter button. But remember, even when you are holding your camera at the faster shutter speeds, like 1 60th of a second or faster, you need to hold it as steady as possible to get a tack sharp image. Another way that we can creatively control our image is through the depth of field. Through the aperture setting, also known as the f-stop, we can control how much of the image is in focus. I'm going to demonstrate how the f-stop controls the lens opening on a manual lens. We can change the f-stop on this manual lens by rotating an outer ring. The aperture settings on this lens range from f2.0 to f22. When I have the lens set to 2.0, you can see how the lens is wide open and therefore lets in a lot of light. And as I click from f2.0 to 2.8, to, to 4, to 5.6, to 8, to 11, and finally to 22, you can see the lens closing down and the size of the opening decreases significantly. So only a small amount of light can be let in at f22. These f-stop numbers are considered to be traditional f-stops, whereas our digital cameras can set the f-stop to numbers in between these traditional f-stops. The smaller the number of the f-stop, the shallower the depth of field will be as shown in this image. The higher the number of the f-stop, the longer the depth of field will be, so more of the image is in focus. For most of us, the lenses we're using are automatic, so the f-stop can be adjusted through a dial on the camera body, which for my Canon is a dial on the top right. The number on the far right of the readout notes the f-stop. You'll also notice the f-stop number on the bottom of the viewfinder. Check your camera manual if you can't figure out how to change the f-stop. Something important to note about depth of field is that the closer you are to your subject, the shallower the depth of field will be. Along with controlling the depth of field in your image, the f-stop also allows more or less light in through the lens. Fast lenses are those that open up to a shallower depth of field, such as f2.8 or f1.8. These are considered fast lenses because they allow for shooting in lower light conditions with your camera handheld. OK, so now let's talk about manual exposure. To review, the ISO setting determines the sensitivity to light, the shutter speed determines how much light is let in based on time, and the aperture determines how much light is let in through the size of the opening on the lens. 
All three of these settings work in relationship with each other to create the exposure of your image. The exposure triangle shows this relationship. So you also now know how the ISO, shutter speed, and aperture affect the way your image looks. The power of working in manual mode is that you, the photographer, can determine all of these settings rather than having the camera automate any of the settings for you. For instance, you can shoot in shutter priority mode, which allows you to set the shutter speed, but the camera will automatically select the aperture setting to give you a correct exposure. You can also shoot in aperture priority mode where you determine the f-stop and the camera will automatically set the shutter speed to give you a correct exposure. But part of being a skilled photographer is knowing how to fully control all of these settings to create the image you envision. So how do you know what a correct exposure would be for your scene? There's a light meter inside of your camera that reads the amount of light reflected off of your subject or scene. This light meter reading helps you to know how to set the shutter speed and aperture on your camera to get a correct exposure. Now let me show you how to get a correct exposure photographing the background. So you can see down below that my exposure is, is set to ISO 100 at 1 80th of a second at f3.5. So this meter that you see here with the numbers minus 3, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3 is your actual light meter reading. So right now, if I depress my shutter button halfway, it'll give me a reading um, at, at that scale. And so you can see that I am, it is set to in between minus one and minus two currently, which means that it's about one and a half stops underexposed, which is what the minus stands for. So it's a bit too dark right now. So since it's a bit dark, I need to let in more light. And I'm going to show you how to do that by adjusting your f-stop right here, 3.5, or the shutter speed. OK. So first, I'm going to show you how to get a correct exposure reading changing the shutter speed. So if I move it to a longer shutter speed, like 1 60th of a second, 1 50th, I'm going to keep scrolling over. And you could see at 1 25th of a second is when the, the light meter reads at zero, or a correct exposure. Now I'm going to show you how to, let's go back to our original exposure of minus 1, 1 point, minus 1 1.5 or so. And now I'm going to show you how to change your f-stop and let in more light to create a correct exposure. So now I'm going to go ahead and move my dial behind the camera so I can change my f-stop. And I'm opening up my lens right now. So you can see here that now it's set to f2.2 and it's giving me a correct exposure reading. If at some point the exposure reading disappears from your view on your viewfinder or on the back of your camera like it just did, all you have to do is depress your shutter button halfway down and it'll reappear again. When you're ready to take the shot, you can just click and take the shot. And now we can see the image on the back of the camera. So let's go through step by step what we need to do to shoot manually. First, set your ISO based on the lighting situation. Next, determine whether the f-stop or the shutter speed is more of a priority creatively in the shot that you want to take. Choose one, either your shutter speed or your aperture, and set it to the appropriate setting for what you envision. Now take a look at what your camera's light meter is reading. Is it underexposed or overexposed? Change the shutter, the shutter speed or the aperture, whichever one you didn't set initially, until your camera's light meter reads as correctly exposed. Now ask yourself the question, can I shoot at the shutter speed handheld and still capture a sharp image? If not, can I put my camera on a tripod? If it is a longer shutter speed, will my image create a motion blur that I do not want if my subject is moving? Let's take a look at what an image with the correct exposure might look like versus an overexposed image or an underexposed image. In this image of the boats, you can see that the middle slide is correctly exposed. We can see the details in the highlights and the shadows and see the midtones clearly. In the image on the left, you can see that the entire image is a bit dark and we're not able to see much detail in the shadows. In the image on the right, some detail starts getting lost in the highlights or the brightest areas. 
So we're discussing how to take a correct exposure, but like all rules in photography, it's relative. Your light meter actually reads light as if your subject is 18% gray. So you can see this is actually a pretty light color. So if your subject is darker than 18% gray, the correct meter reading on your light meter will give you an image that is too dark. So you may need to overexpose your shot to have your subject be bright enough. And if your subject is lighter than 18% gray, such as a snowy scene, then your camera's correct reading might be overexposed. So you'll need to underexpose the shot to get detail in the whites. So now that you know how to read your light meter to get a correct exposure, let's talk about equivalent exposures. An equivalent exposure is one where your f-stop and shutter speed are letting in the same amount of light, but using a different pairing. To understand equivalent exposures, we need to look at the traditional or standard f-stop and shutter speed numbers that were allowed with film cameras. Our digital cameras allow for several settings in between the standard f-stops, but the standard numbers are what we will continue to reference for the sake of understanding exposure settings and stop differences. Working with equivalent exposure is the next step to fully having the creative control that comes with manual exposure. With each f-stop setting, the amount of light let in doubles or halves. So from 1.4 to 2.0, the amount of light that enters through the lens doubles. And with each shutter speed setting, the amount of light doubles and halves as well. 1 500th of a second is double the amount of time of 1 1,000th of a second. 1 250th of a second is double the amount of time as 1 1 500th of a second, and so on. So if your camera's light meter reads at 1 60th of a second at f5.6, this is an equivalent exposure to 1 30th of a second at f4. Equivalent exposures are very handy to know because it allows you to change the f-stop or shutter speed setting based on what you are trying to creatively achieve. Do you want to shoot at a shallower depth of field than your initial meter reading? So after you take your initial exposure reading, you first adjust your f-stop to what you want to shoot at, but make sure that you know how many stop differences between the readout and your desired f-stop. Then you can move your shutter speed to the correct number based on the stops. We call the numbers between each f-stop and shutter speed setting one stop. So all light has a color temperature. For instance, sunlight is considered more blue than a household bulb, which is more yellow. Generally, the auto white balance setting on your camera works pretty well to read the color temperature of the light in your scene. If you want to be precise about shooting images, though, with as accurate color as possible, you might want to change the white balance to the appropriate setting for your scene on your camera. You can see that there are symbols for the different, different types of lighting that you might be shooting, which have a different Kelvin temperature. For most of us, we have it set to auto white balance. Generally, you can set your white balance to auto and it functions pretty well, but sometimes your camera has a difficult time reading in mixed lighting situations. In that case, you should change your white balance setting to match the dominant light in the scene. Let's take a look at the options in our camera menu. We can see that there are options for sunlight, shade, cloudy, tungsten or lamplight, fluorescent light, and flash. To be more precise with the color balance of your shot, you can change the color balance according to the dominant light in your scene. So now that you know the fundamentals of how to use your camera in manual mode and how the various settings affect the way your image looks, let's discuss composition. Composition is extremely important in photography. What you include in the frame and how you compose and arrange what's inside of the frame tell the viewer where to look and even how to look at your image. There are two major compositional strategies, the rule of thirds and the spiral golden ratio or the Fibonacci spiral. I want to remind you though that these are simply guidelines, not rules, that are derived from the way we see and experience visual images. And of course, there are plenty of great images that don't fall within these two compositional strategies. Let's start with the rule of thirds. The rule of thirds divides an image up into nine quadrants, and the subject falls on the intersection of the lines or along the lines itself. In this image, you can see how the subject is falling along the lines. The spiral golden ratio, or the Fibonacci spiral, is a natural order that's found in nature. It leads the viewer's eyes through the entire image and it creates balance. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at this photo by Max Reeve. Uh, he's a landscape photographer and you can see that he's worked with the concept of leading lines to take our eye through this image. So we enter through 
we enter in this image in the foreground and you can see that the, the river flows continuously all the way to the background and it draws our eye from the front of the image or the foreground all the way to the background. And we can see in this image too that he has several leading lines. I think the dominant one is the river, but there are also leading lines um, that, that contour the sides of the mountains and the ranges. So this is a great compositional strategy to use, uh, particularly for those who are working in landscape photography. Um, leading the lines are a great way to draw the viewer uh, through the entirety of the image and create depth. So this is a photograph by a photographer named Bianca de Porter, and she's working with the compositional strategy of a frame within a frame. So our a photograph is already a frame. We're looking through frames all the time to shoot an image. And inside of that frame, you can also consider and look at frames that, it, that are, exist inside of your shot. So here we have the framing of a doorway. Um, you can also work with the framing of, of like a picture frame or even further doorways to create even more depth in the image. So you can see here that um, the outer edges of, of the frame inside of the, the image is um, in shadow and it really uh, draws our eye into this room um, that has light inside and we focus in on the subject more strongly as a result of this compositional strategy of a frame within a frame. Now let's look at this portrait by Graciela Iturbide. I think this is a great example of point of view or perspective in photography. Um, I think something that's very common that beginning photographers do is that, um, is that they shoot everything from the same perspective. And so changing your perspective, moving outside of just standing and shooting whatever is, is face forward in front of you um, will make such a huge difference in creating more compel compelling and visually interesting images. So you can see here that Iturbide decided to photograph this subject from down below, looking up, and it really creates um, a, a regal sense of, of the subject, especially with uh, this crown of iguanas that, uh, that she is wearing. Um, and I don't know that I would call it a crown necessarily if, if, she, if she wasn't photographed from this particular angle or perspective. So you always have to remember that your point of view in terms of what you shoot is one of the most important things. There are many photographers who can look at the same scene, but each photographer may photograph that in a different way because of the point of view and perspective that they've decided to take on that shot. So there are many points of view in which you can shoot a photograph. Now that you know how to use your camera and shoot manually and learned a little bit about composition, it's time for you to practice shooting. I can't wait to see what you create.